Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley to meet with a number of key officials when she visits the United States and Canada next week. New laws to regulate the fishing industry. And in sports, West Indies pacer Alzari Joseph etches his name in the IPL record books. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. And a very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord with the CBC News Night. In our top story, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley will attend several important meetings in Canada and the United States over the next week. She has been invited by McGill University in Montreal, Canada to meet with some of its senior representatives to discuss deepening the relationship between the Bel Air's Research Institute and the government. During her visit to Canada, Ms. Motley will also participate in town hall meetings with the Barbadian diaspora in Montreal and Toronto. In Toronto, the Prime Minister will continue discussions with major financial institutions and accounting firms. In her capacity as Minister of Finance, Economic Affairs and Investment, Ms. Motley will then travel to Washington, D.C. to attend the 2019 annual spring meetings of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund from the 10th to the 14th of April. While new legislation is in the works to govern the fishing industry and operations at local fish markets, Maritime Affairs Minister Kirk Humphrey says it will ensure that standards are improved at the complexes and various boatyard facilities. And he was speaking to the media as his ministry continued its removal of derelict boats. This time, the team visited the Bridgetown Fisheries Complex. And our Rian Phillips tells us more. Five fishing vessels abandoned for as long as 10 years were the main target of the cleanup exercise. Chief Fisheries Officer Stephen Willoughby says the aim is to remove all derelicts across the island. We are trying to remove all of those derelict boats that are um, congesting the boatyards. We, we started in Oystins where we clean up Oystins and remove quite a few boats. Now we are here um, in our first phase where we remove some boats and then at a later stage we are going to come back and remove other boats. Now we are going to move from here, eventually clean up the entire island. So far we have put notices on all the boats, all the derelict boats around the island. During the exercise, an old ice box, which seemed to be occupied by a vagrant, was discovered. Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy Minister Kirk Humphrey describes the site as unfortunate. He reveals new laws will be coming before year end to address several issues in the industry. The legislation has to change. Um, we have to put in place, and we are putting in place, and I'm promising before the end of this year you're going to see new legislation being brought to the Parliament that addresses a number of concerns as it relates to the boatyard, but not only the boatyard, as it relates to fishing and fisheries in general. A more comprehensive piece of legislation that speaks to our fishing habits, um, penalties for, for certain um, indiscretions, and so on. But I think that it is the way we have to go. I mean, if we continue to do what we've been doing, we're going to get what we've been getting. The minister also says market upgrades will start in the next few months. Rianne Phillips, CBC News. Well, Barbadians are being encouraged to take advantage of budding opportunities in the creative industry. Minister of the Creative Economy and Culture John King says that there are exciting business prospects in non-traditional areas. He says with the support now available to sectors such as the film industry, these opportunities should not be wasted. And if you don't grasp it and make the best use of it, you're going to dampen the opportunities of those persons coming behind you. So it's important that you take this as seriously as you, as you, are, you, you can. Because you're not only here for yourselves, but you're here opening some roads and pioneering for a younger set of people who might have the same aspirations as you do today. And Minister King was speaking at the close and certificate presentation of the Business in Film course held at the Barbados Coalition of Service Industries on the Harbour Road. Now, course designer and lecturer Lorna Garner is hoping to have another session soon. She highlighted an area she thinks is key in pushing the local film industry to the next level. What I really want to see more of, and I think that's where the future is, the writing of scripts because in the case of films and TV drama, it starts with the script. There's a lot of writers in Barbados who are very good. They write books, 
but I want to see them writing more film scripts because with the film script, you then go on to shoot, bring in the actors, etc. So we want the producers, and there's a lot of future producers here, to get those scripts and make good films which we can sell. There is a suggestion that reading difficulties may be behind some of the disruptive behavior exhibited by students in the classroom. Senior lecturer in history at the University of the West Indies CAFL campus, Dr. Henderson Carter, says because of these problems, many children cannot follow the syllabus and are leaving school without qualifications. The educator says that reading is vital to a person's development. Even if you place students in a vocational stream, agriculture, masonry, mechanics, hairdressing, they still must be able to read. For example, the hairdresser still needs to read the information on the products that will go on our hair. At least something mischievous happens. Marijuana is being used or trafficked in every secondary school in Barbados. That's according to a study conducted by the Criminal Justice Research Unit. Director Cheryl Willoughby revealed some of the key findings during a recent discussion hosted by the Harrison College Parent Teacher Association. Sharika Griffith has more. The results of a study conducted by the Criminal Justice Research Unit show children as young as seven are using marijuana. In secondary school, over 15% of the population admitted to using marijuana and 3.4% of children at primary school admitted that they use marijuana on a regular basis. 2% of primary school children admitted to selling drugs within the school and this figure was double at secondary school. The research also shows a 35% increase in offences committed by children between the ages of 11 and 15. Given the rise in violent behaviour among young women, the unit has also conducted a study at the Girls' Government Industrial School. It has revealed that some of them are victims of sexual abuse. The average age of girls being raped or sexually molested in Barbados was age 14. And these were not offenses that were committed by total strangers. Over 90% of them were being committed by persons who knew the offender, who parents felt comfortable with these persons coming into their homes. With the many challenges facing our youth, Ms. Willoughby says it's important these issues are diagnosed and treated early. You must advocate to have social workers in schools. In, 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 in our schools, guidance counselors are not social workers. 10% of students at the primary level and 19 at the secondary level also admit to being in a gang. Sharika Griffith, CBC News. Over in Trinidad and Tobago now, about $50 million in government revenue is lost every year due to the illicit trade of tobacco. The estimate has come from the West Indian Tobacco Company Limited, and we hear more in this TTT report. According to the 2018 Annual Report of the West Indian Tobacco Company Limited, total revenue for that year increased by 6% compared to 2017, reaching a total of $920 million. But while the company has increased revenue even in a slowly recovering economy, it laments that millions are still sucked up each year by illicit trade. Local Managing Director Jean-Pierre Ducoudry said the problem has become impossible to ignore. If, in fact, you look at it from a government revenue, you're talking about probably about 25 to 30 million dollars in taxes. And that doesn't even, that's just excise, that doesn't include the extra CARICOM um, duties as well as VAT. So it could get up to about 40 or 50 million dollars. On another note, with government due to bring legislation to decriminalize marijuana soon, shareholders were curious about the potential impact relaxed ganja laws would have on Whitco's profitability as a tobacco trader. Chairman Anthony Phillips said they remain neutral on the issue. There's no comparison between, you know, some people stretch it a little bit and say that there is, but from our point of view, we don't see it as, um, as something that we need to get involved in or be threatened by, um, deny or support, you know. We take a neutral position on it. 
On the question of whether a change in marijuana legislation would see Whitco expanding its product offering, Mr. Ducudre said while they're not ruling it out, it will require a major shift in operations. News further field now. Thousands of protesters in Mali have condemned the government, saying it is not doing enough to stop ethnic violence. The demonstration, one of the biggest in recent years, follows the killing of almost 160 villagers. Anger over the killing of villagers now directed at President Ibrahim Keita. Protesters gathered in their thousands at the capital Bamako in one of Mali's biggest demonstrations in years. Protesters say the government and UN forces are not doing enough to stop the bloodshed. Mali is going through a multidimensional crisis. We have witnessed killings that Mali has never known in its history, in its entire history. Last month, at least 157 people were killed in the Mopti region. Members of the Dogon ethnic community have been accused of carrying out the attack on Fulani herders in the village of Ogasago. The two groups are often in conflict over access to land. The killings are believed to be the deadliest incident of ethnic violence in Mali in a generation. Opposition parties and some religious leaders say the president has failed to act. Today, President Keita's regime is condemned. His prime minister is not capable of resolving the country's problems. He must accept the people's will, which is democratic change, transparency in the country's management, not using Malians against each other. 73-year-old President Keita has said he'll deliver justice and has replaced two of his top generals, saying Malians need to feel secure. Despite a peace deal in 2015, his government is struggling to control several active armed groups linked to al-Qaeda and ISIL.